Awesome. I, I'm ready. I'm ready whenever you are. Okay, let's do this. Um, okay. So, David, I am so yeah. excited to have you on the podcast. I was saying earlier that I've seen bits and pieces of your story online um, quite a bit, and it's just so powerful and it's impacted so many people. And so I'm so excited to have the opportunity to hear your whole story today. And yes, I'd love for you to just kind of take it away. Oh, okay. Um, gosh, I'm a, I'm a old fellow. I'm 69 and I live in a van on the coast of New South Wales. And that, that's a bit of a story in itself, but I was born and raised in the United States in Olympia, Washington, and got uh, raised in a Catholic family. And then uh, if you're 69, if you're a baby boomer, I got caught up in the, the hippie movement toward the end of the 60s when that rolled up the West Coast from San Francisco in the summer of 1967. You know, I was 13 years old and got caught up in it and decided I was going to be a hippie. And I threw my Catholic upbringing in the, in the garbage can and just gave myself to the whole uh, counterculture uh, depravity, you know. But it didn't start out like that. We wanted to change the world and love one another and love, peace, and joy. There's nothing wrong with love, peace, and joy, but it... it uh, the means to the end didn't work very well, it crashed and burned terribly. And then uh, after eight years of that, by the time I was 21, I was essentially a, a burnout and uh, cynical, bitter, a huge burden of guilt and bitterness and uh, didn't believe in anything. Uh, just really had gotten myself into a condition in my soul that I didn't believe in God, I didn't believe in myself, I, I just thought the whole world was a big joke. I probably would have been dead or in prison within a few years at that point. And uh, I don't know if you saw this movie that came out recently, uh, what was it called, uh, The Jesus Revolution? I haven't seen that, yeah. but I did well, hear about it. At that time, there was this, this thing that exploded on the West Coast and then swept across the United States and around the world actually including Australia here, called the, the Jesus Movement. And it was just basically a, a bunch of young people like me that had trashed themselves and had gotten a really bad conscience and essentially counterculture hippie-type young people that turned to Jesus. You know, they're on acid and they read their Bible and they oh, Jesus, you know. <laughs> totally, yeah. And, and so there was this explosion of of young people turning to God because they were carrying a burden of guilt for doing things when they were in their teens and early 20s that their parents never dreamed of doing. And mm -hmm. uh, they found relief from that by, by turning to God with their whole heart. And they did it generally outside of the conventional religious systems. And there was just an explosion of, uh, of young, young people that had turned to Jesus and they were all excited and, and uh, living together, living communally, Christian coffee shops, just all, all sorts of things like this. There were just tons of Jesus houses, just literally thousands of them around the world, mostly concentrated in North America, particularly the United States, and even more particularly the West Coast. But um, some of those people came into my hometown, and uh, I ran into them, and they read to me about... Christ died for my sins, they read to me about the passion of Jesus from the Gospel of John. And of course, being raised in the Catholic Church, I'd heard Christ died for my sins a thousand times. But it really, in my condition of desperation and guilt and bitterness, uh, it's like it really, really cut me to the heart. And I, I was just, I just really believe this is true. Jesus actually died for my sins. There really is a God. He really loves me. And, and uh, it was just uh, really a wonderful thing. It, and I, I said, well, you know, I basically broke down in tears. And I, I said, what do I do? Just like in the book of Acts in chapter 2, you know, the ones that were cut to the heart. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And, of course, they didn't say, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is what uh, Peter said on the day of Pentecost. What they said is... Uh, 
what, what they said is, here, pray this prayer. Ask Jesus into your heart to be your personal Lord and Savior. So I did. And, um, you know, that was, I experienced a tremendous release and, and uh, a sense of forgiveness and just knowing that Christ had died for me and that, that there really was a God. And, of course, the, one of the biggest things was I realized, my word, there's something true on the earth. The Bible is actually true. I mean, and if if you if you come to a place where you didn't believe anything was true, and then all of a sudden you realize there's something that's true, it's a very big deal. So I, I grabbed that that book, I grabbed the Bible, and I just started devouring it. it. It's kind of funny too because essentially I became an evangelical Christian that day. That's what evangelical Christians do. They 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 come under conviction of sin, and their their understanding of of uh, Christian initiation is asking Jesus into your heart to be your personal Lord and Savior. And so I became an evangelical Christian, but three days in, I was already a misfit <laughs> because I, I'm reading my Bible, and I get to the Book of Romans, and I get to Romans chapter six, where it, where Paul says. What shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Don't you know that as many of us as been, has, have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we've been joined in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. And, it, it, you know, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we would no longer be slaves of sin. For whoever has died has been freed from sin. And he goes on and on in that vein, you know, and I'm like, why didn't they baptize me? And I, I hunted these characters up, and I'm like, look at this, Romans 6, why didn't you baptize me? <laughs> and they were like, oh, well, uh, 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 well, baptism doesn't save anybody, uh, but uh, we, we, I guess we could baptize you if you insist. <laughs> and I, was like, I was like, what's wrong with you people? I got to be baptized. And so they, they took me down to Capitol Lake in the center of my hometown of Olympia, Washington, and they dunked me, man. But, wow. But you know what happened? You know what happened when they dunked me? What happened? I got wet. <laughs> I just got wet because they didn't have any authority to baptize me. They didn't even believe it was part of the process of being of of uh they didn't believe that it, like right. peter said be baptized every one of you for the remission of your sins and you shall mm -hmm. receive they didn't believe that you had to be baptized for the remission of your sins e even though it's and and so this was the beginning three days in i began to realize uh wow the bible's amazing but this whole Bible only thing is a can of worms <laughs> because they, they say they believe the Bible only is their rule and faith and practice but three days in I already knew that that it was a fantasy you know what I mean? <laughs> at least partly I knew well in this way this is just weird why didn't they baptize me and and so that began a journey within evangelical Christianity because having been raised Catholic I, at one point I actually went back and reinvestigated Catholicism within the context of the, what's called the Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement, which was an explosion of kind of evangelical, Pentecostal, born-again uh, Catholicism that took place. I mm -hmm. went back and investigated that, but but basically, I knew I knew just that the the Catholic Church was apostate, and that the Orthodox churches were better, but still. It, very early on, I real, just from reading the Bible, I knew that there had to be apostles and prophets for the church to work. You know, Acts chapter 15, it's, it's like there's a big controversy about whether or not you need to keep the law of Moses and be circumcised in order to be saved if you're a Gentile. And they didn't just all grab their Bibles and figure it out and argue about it and start different denominations over the question. Uh, Paul and Barnabas were sent from Antioch where it was just creating huge controversy and disorder and disunity 
and they go back to Jerusalem to an apostolic and prophetic council and they submit the question and they grope together until they hear unanimously from Heavenly Father by the Holy Ghost how to sort this out that the that the Gentiles did not need to be circumcised and keep the Mosaic law and and then they they send back an authoritative decision and and that goes back to Antioch and everybody's encouraged and there, there's peace and unity again and then Paul and Barnabas in Acts 16 4 uh, they, they go back to every single church that they started throughout Asia Minor on the first missionary journey and it says they delivered to them the decrees for to keep which had been determined by the apostles in Jerusalem and so you know just reading the Bible you read that and it's like without apostles and prophets there's no possibility of unity and it can't be based on a book because back throughout most of human history books didn't even exist and if they did hardly anybody could read them like in, in 1500 a AD in Europe um, about a lot, historians estimate that about 11 percent of the population was literate so what did the other nine <laughs> the another nine out of ten people scripture soul is a total fantasy and and um, so in in any case very early on I realized that it, the the division and the disunity evangelical charismatic and Pentecostal Christianity is approximately 600 million believers and the rest of non-Latter-day Saint Christianity is approximately another 1.6 billion but I spent the next 47 years within the context of evangelical Pentecostal and charismatic Christianity searching for the restoration <laughs> That's what I was looking for, man. I was looking for a place where when I read something in the Bible, it was actually embodied in the church. Especially, especially living apostles and prophets. I mean, I, I read it right there in Ephesians 2.20 that, you know, the, the church is on the foundation of apostles and prophets. You read 1 Corinthians 12, and it's so explicit that it lists the, the, the gifts and ministries that God appointed in the body of Christ, which Jesus and his body are supposed to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. And first in order is apostles, prophets, you know, and then other gifts, you know, gifts of miracles, healings, helps, administrations, evangelists, teachers, all these other things. But prime of place is always apostles and prophets because it's so foundational to the point where like in Ephesians 4 it's it says that apostles prophets evangelists pastors and teachers were given to the church until when given to the church until we all to, to um, what is it gave this to equip the saints for works of service until we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, which last time I checked hasn't happened yet. But without apostles and prophets, there's no possibility. There's absolutely no possibility of it happening. So the, the penny dropped for me like like within a year of, of me becoming an evangelical Christian. I'm like, where's the apostles and prophets? Where's the authority? Because evangelical charismatic and Pentecostal Christianity Ashley is divided into at last count 44,000 different groups mm. and denominations and wow. they don't even all agree on the Trinity some of them are non-trinitarian but the vast majority of them of course do agree on the Trinity and the only thing that they're united in and this is the stunning thing this is why I'm so burdened and I just have to like pour my heart out and just throw it out there into the I dark love it. I okay love it. I'm looking for the restoration passionately searching for the restoration okay because apart from apostolic and prophetic authority rightly dividing the word and receiving ongoing revel I knew there was no possibility of sorting this out of actually knowing what's true and what's not there just isn't you the scripture is of no private interpretation the scripture itself says that okay so how does scripture soul is supposed to work 
if people are just supposed to grab their Bible and figure it out for themselves. But the fruit of everybody grabbing their Bible and figuring it out for themselves is 44,000 different Christian groups and denominations. And I literally searched the earth and time and space trying to find something. Where I was looking for the city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God, just like it says in Hebrews. That's what I was searching for. I was like a pilgrim within evangelical, charismatic, and Pentecostal Christianity. And you'd find something where it seemed like something was, was real or maybe solid, and I'd, I'd throw myself into it, and then it'd just, I'd just be crushingly disappointed again. And um, I was a pain in the butt, I'm sure, to, to all of the, you know. I was always like, look, Scripture sola, it says this. Why aren't we doing that? Scripture sola, it says don't do this. Why are we doing this? For example, the professional ministry, okay? All of evangelical, charismatic, and Pentecostal, well, you can't say all about any of it because yeah, it's just united about everything. But the vast majority of this is highly professionalized to the point where a lot of evangelical, charismatic, and Pentecostal churches are thinly disguised businesses, do you know? Right. They, they really yeah. are. I mean, it's nuts how, how, how extreme that can get. Uh, yeah, you know, the pastor driving around, you know, making like three million a year and driving his Learjet. Uh, it's just crazy how, how uh, oh, but in, in any case, the, the one thing, it, it's, it's like the disunity of it, the division, the continual ongoing division, like, like there'll be, this is early January, getting later in January. By the end of this year, there's going to be another 1,300 Christian denominations. Mm -hmm. You know, because they split and they split and they split and they split because people want to run their own show. They divide over doctrine. They divide over money. They divide over power. They divide over everything from soup to nuts. But the thing that's shocking is the one thing that they're absolutely united in is they're filled with absolute slander, dismissiveness, despising, and... Um, absolute lies about the restoration and this is why i looked for the restoration for 47 years man. and i never even thought to take an honest look at where it was because all you heard was they're not even christians the, the members of the actual church of jesus christ of latter-day saints on the earth the, the only true restored church with genuine apostolic and prophetic authority, restored through Joseph Smith according to the pattern of the early church with a quorum of 12, you know, and, and a leading apostolic and pr prophet, you know, threefold cords everywhere you look. Uh, the, the only church on earth that has is the restoration is constantly painted the conversation is absolutely monolithic that they are not even Christians. Their Jesus is not the real Jesus or Jesus is a demon. Their God is not the real God. Their God is a demon. They're headed for the lake of fire because they're deceived cultists. It's so sad. Somebody should really help them. But you really should not go within a country mile of those people or even dream. S somehow, somehow, the evil is so profound that they're actually able to appear and even seem to be like really nice. <laughs> and, see, I, I had regular interaction with, with Latter-day Saints, with Mormons. I, I never once heard them called Latter-day Saints or members of the Church yeah. of Jesus Christ. They weren't called, they were not called members of the Church of Jesus Christ. That would be heresy to call them that because it isn't the Church of Jesus Christ and they're not Christians. So they were only called Mormons or cultists or damned cultist, uh, mm -hmm. but the, the, monolith, the monolithic conversation was that there is no light there, it's only darkness, and, and to the point where if you, if, you, if you were unwise enough to allow yourself to be drawn in the direction of investigating the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, like meet with the missionaries, not to Bible bash them and 
tear down their faith, but actually because you actually wanted to find out what they actually believe from their own mouths or started reading the Book of Mormon with any kind of serious intent other than to, than to just mock it, you'd be canceled, especially if you were on any position, any position at all within the, uh, the clergy system of, of the, the, the professional clergy system. You would just be out on your ear before you could say Jack Robinson. I mean, but, but the, professional, the professional ministry of it was profoundly disturbing to me because I read in Acts 20 when Paul is saying goodbye to the Ephesian elders in Miletus, he knows they will never see his face again. He had lived with these men for three years, had, had brought them to Christ, had made disciples, and then elders out of the elders. It's the same word as bishops. They were the bishops of all the thousands of believers in Ephesus. They were the overseers of them. And he meets with them to pour out his heart for the last time. And what he says to them, he says, look, you know how I lived among you for three years. I coveted no one's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know these hands of mine provided for my own needs and for the needs of those that were with me. I've shown you in every single thing that I did that by this kind of hard work, you must support the weak and, of course, also support yourselves. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that it's more blessed to give than to receive. And, you know, having said these things, they all fell on his neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for what he said, that they'd never see his face again, and they accompanied him to, the, to his ship. But earlier in that passage, he says, men from your own number are going to rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves, so be on your guard. I warned you night and day with weeping about this. And that's exactly what happened. A, a few years later, if you read in, um, in the book of... of uh, Second Timothy, all in, they'd all deserted him. They'd all deserted mm -hmm. him not many years after that. And, and uh, w what they were drawn away into is professional ministry. But in any case, I just say all this to say that this, what I call it, kind of the, the term I've coined for this, this just tidal wave of slander that fills the non-Latter-day Saint Christianity about the Restoration. Of course, the source of it is the accuser of the brethren, because that, that's his full-time job, is to paint the most glorious light and be, most beautiful thing on earth as the darkest, most evil thing on earth. And to paint evil things as good, to paint mm -hmm. things that, that aren't the truth as truth. And, and this is his full-time job. And he's basically in charge of the great spacious building that flows in the air with no foundation, which, which is the mocking voices of the world and, to, truth be told, of, of the non-Latter-day Saint Christian world because they're fully on board and even more so with the same slander that the world loves to indulge in towards the city of God, okay? And uh, this this is... So I, I call it an accusatory fog, and I didn't even know until I read the Book of Mormon that, that in Lehi's dream, the accusatory fog is pouring forth from the great and spacious building, and it's called the mist of darkness, of course. But, and, and it comes to people, even people that are starting to eat from the tree of life, if they, if they, if they heed those voices, they let the fruit drop from their hand, and, and they walk away ashamed, and they're lost in the darkness. And those, very sadly, I just got an email yesterday, and I get emails like this constantly from a Latter-day Saint missionary about how sad it is. Like, like they'll, they'll meet with investigators, and they're just, they get all excited, and they're just, they're, their heart and their eyes just fill with light. And, and then, then they go back excitedly to tell their Christian friends and their pastor about what they're, what they're discovering. And um, and then the next time they meet them, they're filled with darkness again, and, and they're, they're just like there's just like walls up and everything. But this is this is what I was trapped in. From the age of 21, I was actively seeking the restoration. I was actually seeking the true church, and actually had a, a good idea of what I was looking for. And I did not find it because I swallowed all this accusatory fog and just, just believed it. I, I just, 
which is my fault, you know. <laughs> I mean, if if I had if I had known my Bible and been a little bit smarter, I would have realized what Jesus says in uh, in John, in Luke chapter six. He says, "Look, blessed are you when men exclude you and cast out your name as evil, and say all manner of evil against you." For the Son of Man's sake, rejoice and leap for joy, for great is your reward in heaven. For in just the same way they spoke about the prophets that were before you. So if, if the penny would have dropped on that, I would have said, okay, I've been looking for this for 30 years and I'm not finding it anywhere. Um, the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing and expect different results. Maybe I should take a different tack in light of that scripture, what is the group on earth that claims to be disciples of Jesus Christ, but they're absolutely excluded and their name is cast out as evil by everybody? Who could that be? And I would have been, oh, God, it's the Mormons. <laughs> the, the only other possibility, it would have had to have been, it would have narrowed my choice, my, my search down from 44,000 people, 44,000 different groups and churches, to two. It would have had to have been either the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses. And the Jehovah's Witnesses don't have apostles and prophets. And they're not organized according to the true church. And, and there's all sorts of stuff about them that is just, even though they believe they believe the Bible only, it's just obviously biblically wacky, you know. Uh, so, essentially... <laughs> But but you know I I'm I'm over I, kicking myself about this Ashley because it's it's pretty obvious that Heavenly Father sovereignly had a hand in allowing me to wander around in in circles, fighting my way through the jungle of the confusion of this uh, non Latter Day Saint Christianity. So I'd be on fire when I finally found it. I'd be on fire to do whatever I could to shout from the housetops the glory and the light of the restoration of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and just blow holes in the midst of, midst of darkness with everything in me until my dying breath. Which, you know, if I'd found it when I was 22, you know, I'd, it might have been a lot nicer in some ways, but I, w I wouldn't be the crazy man that I am. I'm essentially, I'm essentially like, like right out of the Blues Brothers at this point. Yeah, you're very loved by a lot of people. So, well, I, I'm on a mission from God. I, I am actually on, <laughs> I'm on a mission from God to, to, uh, to just shout it from the housetops, Ashley, because yep, the church is so wonderful. It is so wonderful. I agree with you so much. So many things you've said are just they resonate with me so much about, I don't know, you keep going. I just, no, I that's, that's basically, oh, that's basically it. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I guess, I guess just, you know, how did I actually finally find the restoration? Yes, I, That's what I want to know. How, after all this time, like, you know, you're spending, did you say 47 years looking? Yeah. I spent 47 years actively 47 looking years. and I never, okay. I never once stopped looking. Well, when I'd be crushingly disappointed, I'd just sit there and prayerfully, okay, what do I do now? What's next? And I'd lick my wounds and gather my strength and then give it another go, you know. So basically, mm -hmm. I've been nonstop searching for the restoration from the age of 21 to the age of 68. And uh, the way I finally found it uh, started with me giving up because after 45 years, of searching and not finding it, I was like, I don't know what to do. And so I ended up, I decided I was in Australia at that point, and that's a whole story in itself, but uh, that I don't need to go into. But I have dual citizenship. So I'm, I'm actually moving back to the United States now. I'm moving oh. to Idaho. Oh and my gosh. I love well, my little camper van. This has been my broadcasting studio for the I love it. I love it. <laughs> you know what? I found the exact same van in Spokane, Washington. Oh my so god. I'm flying into Spokane on, on February 29th. 
and um, the, the the man that's selling me this van is picking me up at the airport in the van. I'll load my luggage into the van, drop him back off, and drive down to Idaho. So I love that. What? So what's in Idaho? Well, it just seems it just seems like that's where Heavenly Father's leading me. But it's more than that. I mean, my family roots are in Montana. That's where the family awesome. farm is. It's in Frenchtown, Montana. My favorite sister is in eastern Washington. Another favorite sister is in Frenchtown there. I have a brother in Frenchtown running the family farm, raising cattle and wheat and uh, alfalfa right now. Uh, I've made a lot of really good friends through my channel and through three trips last year out to Utah doing these testimony potluck picnics and doing mm -hmm. firesides and stuff that have hosted me and we become close. And just a lot of people I've corresponded back and forth with for the last year. And, and they all live in basically Utah and, and North, yeah. northern I and, and most yes. southern Idaho and Utah. So it, it's just I've been over here 13 years. I'm a born and raised American. It's, it's just time for me to go back to the chaos of the United States and um, and just plop myself down in the middle of all these wonderful people. It just seems like I might be able to do more good there than mm -hmm. from over here. Uh, well, we're excited to have you back here. Yeah. So anyway, how did how did I find the restoration? Yes, so let's go back to that. How back. did you find the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? The way I found the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is after 45 years, I, I was just at the end of my rope. And so I, I just, what I heard in my heart, see, I, I honestly believe I didn't have the Holy Ghost until... I actually got baptized by proper priesthood authority last March 20th and then was prayed for to receive the Holy Ghost. And I actually received the Holy Ghost as my constant companion. Yay! Yay! Hooray! Hooray for proper priesthood authority where you, where you get baptized and you don't just get wet. When I finally got <laughs> baptized, it was my sixth time. Five oh, times I'd, I'd just gotten wet over the previous, you know, part of my life. <laughs> Don't and when I got prayed for to receive the Holy Ghost, four times previously I'd been prayed for to receive the Holy Ghost, and I didn't, <laughs> you know. But I did, I did, Heavenly Father, He was guiding me, I don't know, through His holy angels. And the Holy Ghost can, can come upon you. He isn't within you as your constant companion. But if you have a sincere heart, Heavenly Father's like, yay, A for effort. And, he, you know, especially... Yeah. He draws near, the Holy Ghost comes near to anyone who is of a broken and contrite spirit, which I was on a regular basis because I was just a miserable wretch. Nothing I did, I, I was trying desperately to bear fruit for God for that whole 45 years, and everything I did crashed and burned. I was hurt a lot and disappointed a lot, crushingly disappointed, but I also hurt and crushingly disappointed others. There's hardly... Because I was trying to be a man of God and make a difference in people's lives, but I didn't have the authority to do it. And if if that's where you're at, you, you give people a hope, but it disappoints them because you don't really have the authority to do what you're doing on a solid foundation. So you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So after 45 years of just hurting and being hurt and being disappointed, and like it says in Proverbs, hope disappointed makes the heart sick. And I could never get to the second half of the verse which I'll tell you in a minute. But I was like, okay, I give up. I'm just going to stop trying to find this. And I'm just going to move into this little Toyota camper van and I'm just gonna go live along the coast of New South Wales. And I'm going to see, because I have to have something constructive to do, I'm gonna see if I can memorize the Gospel of John. And I'm gonna pray and ask Heavenly Father to please open my eyes and show me what I'm not seeing. Because I knew it had to be on the earth somewhere, because in, in, in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 59 and 60, it says, uh, when darkness comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise up a standard in the midst of it. And I'm like, well, darkness is certainly coming in like a flood, but I can't find the standard. Where is the standard? Okay. And... Um, I gave up because I'd been looking for 45 years, Ashley. I mean, honestly, try to imagine that. It's not, mm -hmm. it's absolute. I don't know how I kept going. It's just, it must have been 
what I was supposed to, because Heavenly Father continually would throw me a bone of grace and strength to just go around the mountain one more time, and I just never gave up, not once. Um, so that's what I did for the next two years, was I just lived in my van and uh, took care of myself and prayed and tried to memorize the Gospel of John. And then on, amazingly, on December 23rd, which a thousand people have told me since is Joseph Smith's birthday, on December 23rd of 2022, which is slightly over a year ago, okay, uh, I'm in my van, and this thought comes into my mind and heart, you have to find out what the Mormons believe. You have to find out what the Mormons believe. And I'm just like, what? Because this was like, I was filled with judgment and arrogance and accusation towards the restoration that it's like, it's like I had been in a, in a vat of dark blue dye or something, you know, for my entire life about the Mormons. And it was inconceivable to me that there would be any point in trying to find out what the Mormons believe, but I could not shake it. And so I was like, it has to be, <laughs> this has to be God, you know? So I was like, I better, you know, I've been to asking God to show me what I'm missing. I better, I better do this. <laughs> so I, I, I didn't even have a laptop. <laughs> I'd never owned a smartphone, never used a smartphone. Wow. Know? Okay. I was, a, I was a strange person. I still am. All right. <laughs> but I go to the library and I look up, where's the nearest Church of Jesus Christ? <laughs> and there's one in Dapto, this town of Dapto in South, New South Wales, 15 minutes away from me. And so I get the phone number and I call it up. And there's these cheery voice. Hello. And I'm like, uh, who are you? <laughs> We're the sister missionaries. <laughs> and I'm like, wh what? I didn't even know there was such a thing. This is all I'd run into are these, these wonderful young men, with their elder badges, and I'd had my guard against up against up against them my entire life because I'm like, elders, you're 19, man, just go away. <laughs> you know, I'm 48. I know the Bible like the back of my hand, and you think you're gonna tell me something? You know, they never they never got anywhere with me okay but these say where are the sister missionaries i was like what i was like i have to find out what the mormons believe and they're like okay when i'm like let's meet tomorrow at, at the the shell harbor uh shell harbor village foreshore they're like okay and I say, well, we can meet at a picnic table there. So they, they came down on, on uh, Christmas Eve the next day, and we sat at a picnic table. We sat at a picnic table there next to the Pacific Ocean. And uh, it was stunning. It was absolutely stunning, Ashley. Because really, I wasn't looking for doctrine, do you know? Although doctrine is part of it. I mean... The true church has right doctrine. The true church, for example, I knew would, if you said, what must I do? They wouldn't say, pray this prayer. They'd say, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's like somehow, what, what happened on the day of Pentecost, somehow nobody thought it was good enough anymore? I'm like, I, I, knew, you know, I knew the plan of salvation was right there in Acts 2. I'd known that since, you know, if a few days into being an evangelical Christian, <laughs> you know. Uh, but in any case, I sit down, but what I was actually looking for was authority. I was looking for the authority of the kingdom of God because the, the center, the heart of the kingdom of God on earth is, is the actual authority of Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ embodied on earth in those that he has sent, <laughs> you know, which are the apostles and prophets, which is why, like when I read my Bible, they're like, do you want to receive Jesus? Pray this prayer. But then I read, then I read the Gospels, and throughout the Gospels, Jesus says that in order to receive him, what do you have to do? Uh, Matthew ten thirty nine, for example, 
he says to his apostles, he says, he who receives you receives me and him who sent me. <laughs> you can't mm -hmm. receive him without receive, receiving those that he sent with the apostolic, prophetic, and priesthood authority to give you something to stand on, man. That, that when you say, what must I do, they actually have the authority to tell you what to do what and how then you should live, what you should believe and how then you should live, that's actually from our Heavenly Father and not just from human intellect or whatever, okay? And so I, was, I've been, I, would, I knew I was looking for apostolic and prophetic authority embodied in a people, okay? And I sat across from these two sister missionaries. And they were just Sister Braithwaite and Sister Devereaux, you know. I owe them my life. They, they opened their mouth and, you know, we prayed a prayer and they opened the, the, their little booklet, The Plan of Salvation, and they start reading it to me. And it's exactly right out of Acts chapter 2, you know. And I'm like, What? What? But it wasn't just what they were saying. What they were saying had authority behind it. There was authority behind it. And it isn't something you can see. But if you're humble and sensitive, you can't miss it any more than you can miss the, the leaves. The, you can't see the wind, but you can see the leaves moving, you know. It's like, it's like at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says all these amazing things, but it wasn't just what he said. The last verse of chapter 7 of Matthew, it says the people were astonished at his teaching because he taught as one having authority and not as their teachers of the law. And these sisters had authority. They actually had authority from the God of heaven. And it, it, it was palpable because they were in love. They, they were... They both had letters from the prophet, you know. They had been sent, and they were in love with the prophet, in love with the church. And, and you know, faulty, just 19-year-old young ladies, but they were, they were there with a purpose, and they were there seriously, and they were under authority. And li like Sister Braithwaite gave me her Leohona magazine from the October 2022 conference, and she'd tab the whole thing with pink tabs, every article. <laughs> and and you'd, you'd, you'd turn to an article, especially the article that was President Nelson's talk, you know, like Ivy and curlicues and highlighting and exclamation points. And I mean, they were just, they were there with the authority of the God of heaven behind them because they were representing the prophets and apostles and the church it was restored through the prophet Joseph Smith. And I, I was just, I was stunned. I was absolutely stunned. I was like, what? What? This is, this, this, this smells like, this tastes like, this feels like what I've been looking for my whole life. And it's embodied in these two young ladies. It just blew my mind. And so I started attending the ward. And I kept meeting with them. And um, what actually, did you? What was it like when you went to church that first time? Like, what did you? Oh, I loved it. Me. I I absolutely loved it. It's just a simple, humble little ward, about a hundred people. The bishop, wonderful, warm. About half the ward are islanders, and islanders are just you know from from Tahiti, from Samoa, from Tonga, from you know Fiji. <laughs> And they're just, they're just like the warmest, uh, just most relaxed, just, it's just all about love and togetherness. And they're just simple, humble, happy, and thankful people that are, they're just glad you're there and they mean it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it was the most, it, they were the most wonderful, the Latter-day Saints that are just simple, center of the covenant path, trusting the prophet people. They're the, they're the happiest people on earth. They're simple, humble, happy, and thankful. And they're relaxed, and they're not judgmental, and they're not intense, and they're not pushy. They're just like, hey, isn't it wonderful? We're so glad you're here. 
and I, I just it's like like one of the things I've been looking for is what Jesus he said look love one another as I have loved you by this all men will know who are truly my disciples but on the ground that's what love really looks like it's it's patient it's kind it's not intense it's not pushy if somebody is they actually they're really happy to hear what you have to say from your heart and and they don't judge you for it and then they tell you what's in their heart and you know I could hardly find those kinds of people in my Christian experience I'm not saying they're not good people I'm just saying there's a dynamic and a huge you know what a huge part of it comes from Ashley mm -hmm. is what? when you're an evangelical Christian particularly depending on where you are in evangelical Christianity it, it's it varies tremendously but especially in some branches of it like like Calvinism and stuff like that man it is so intense and so scary because if if you don't have the right doctrine you're going to eternal torment in the lake of fire and there's actually if, if you're crazy enough to be a Calvinist you actually believe that most human beings this God who is nothing but love created most human beings for the express purpose of being damned and tormented for all eternity and it's not even possible for them to be saved because Jesus only died for the elect I mm -hmm. mean this is how wacky it can be that that's yeah. that's how totally wacky it can be but you know I mean I just remember like for years like I'd visit my parents and I, I'd just be like under all this pressure because I hadn't gotten them to ask Jesus into their heart to be their personal Lord and Savior and they were gonna die without being saved I, I mean can you under can you can you see the the crazy yeah not the, the crazy intense that dynamic that brings into human relationships you but but in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, we actually understand the glory and the power of the atonement is ultimately ultimately going to reach absolutely everybody, but those who are determined to fend it off and follow Satan into the lake of fire, but which is really not going to be hardly anybody relative to the number of human beings. But you, you know, just just the concept that once people leave mortality. Their eternal destiny is set. They're either going to heaven. There's only two, two, two possible eternal destinies. You're either going to heaven or you're going to the lake of fire to be tortured for all eternity. And everybody's either in one category or the other. It, it's, but but we we understand that that heaven that the the atonement is going to give all people eternal life and it's going to reach and bless after the veil most people I think are going to respond in the spirit world and then who knows what happens during the millennium do you know all the temple work that's done there mm -hmm. but but that that the power of the glory of of Jesus Christ's sacrifice and the incredible creativity and power of the love of our Heavenly Father through his son and by the Holy Ghost and through his church and through the temple work and through the missionaries and through the work on the other side of the veil and then all the temple work done for the other side of the veil during the millennium that ultimately it's like I meet these people and they think I'm fine they don't think I'm going to hell because I'm not a Latter-day Saint they, they you understand how different that is Mm -hmm. It's like most evangelical churches that I'd gone into over that 47 years, you go in there, I'd say half of them at least, and somebody will come up to you and give you the eye, you know, the, and, and ask you the key questions that if you don't answer right, you're somebody to be watched out for because you're probably a wolf in sheep's clothing who's wolf. there. Uh, you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like I, I, go, I go to this little ward, nobody's suspicious. Nobody's suspicious. Nobody's like checking me out with a jaundiced die. I mean, they're just like, they're just like uniformly glad I'm there. And I could actually talk to them. And they actually had corresponding hearts. It's just nuts. And then I, I got to tell you one other little thing. 
two weeks in, in spite of all this glorious stuff that I've already told you, two weeks in, we get into all this stuff and I, I start, I, I do some research, you know, and I'm asking some hard questions <laughs> because it's not easy to make a transition from yeah. think, thinking a group of people are a bunch of devils from hell to realizing that they're God's true covenant people on earth, you know, mm -hmm. and then, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I, I started like, it, you know, the, the whole polygamy thing and the golden plates thing and the Urim and the Thummim thing. And I'm like, gosh, I, I don't, this is just too weird. And, and so I'm just kind of like, you know, I'm like reacting. I'm being really strongly drawn and I'm, I'm like halfway there. And then, my whole soul goes, ah, you, you know, and I just, yeah. and so I, I dig in my heels and I, I call the sisters up and I, I just can't do this. I just can't do this. I, I, I can't meet with you anymore. This is just too weird. And, um, as soon as I did that, Ashley, I guess this is, this is the only reason I might qualify for the comeback podcast because I had come. And then I left. I was like, no, no, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. So I left. Like, this was about mid-January last year, basically one year ago. I just drew the line. I said, I can't do this. I'm out of here. I'm not going to, don't call me. And in virtually no time, I was like, I knew in a way I had never known anything before that I had judged something that I had no authority to judge and that I had grieved the Holy Spirit and grieved our Father in Heaven in a way that I'd never grieved Him before and that I was just being proud and scared because basically if you're like a lifelong evangelical Christian and you become a Latter-day Saint, you lose your whole life. You know, you're cut off by all your relatives and friends. It's a scary thing. It's not an easy thing. It depending on your particular circumstances. But I just realized that I was just being proud and arrogant and scared and that I had judged something I had no authority to judge. And I, I just basically... I was just broken hearted over it and I just literally fell on my face and I just begged our Heavenly Father to forgive me and I told him, I made a vow, I said, you know, I just want to be humble, I know you're drawing me and if this is your covenant people, I want, I want to allow myself to be drawn, I just want to be humble and just allow you to have your way even if it means you make a Mormon out of me. You know? <laughs> And, uh, and from that moment, Ashley, it's like glory came down and just filled my soul and it hasn't stopped since. It's like, because a thousand times out of a thousand, who does Heavenly Father give grace to? To the humble. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And I, somehow I humbled myself in a way I never had before because this was like the defining crisis of my life where Heavenly finally, Father finally brought me to like the border of the Promised Land, to the River Jordan and said, okay, it's time for you to cross over into the Promised Land. And I was, you know, like the children of Israel, I was like, no, there's giants there. We won't go, there's giants there. So it was, it was like, and all of a sudden it's like from then on, it's like I'd listen, I'd listen to the conference talks and everything. I'd been studying the Bible and just trying to sort this stuff out for my entire adult life for like 47 years at that point. And I, like, I'd listen to the conference talks, all right? And, and all these bombs would be going off in my heart where everything that I'd learned for 47 years just melted seamlessly into the restoration. It's just like the most amazing thing. It's just like beyond... It's like completely beyond human understanding as far as I'm concerned. It's like a class triple A miracle. And uh, it's like, 
it's like the vastness. I, I mean, I haven't even scratched the surface of it, but the vastness of the restoration, as soon as I really humbled myself, it just began to open up to me. And it still took me another two months after that before I heard powerfully and definitively in my heart before faith completely came to me that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God and that Joseph Smith truly was a prophet of God. And that was a, that was a stunning experience in itself that I will never ever forget. But but that's, you know, that, that faith came to me on the 13th of March last year and I, I, uh, I was with the sister missionaries at visiting this elderly widow, Sister Norma. <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, we had heard about um, she had shared her testimony with us which really spoke to me and then the sister -ish missionaries asked me what I've been reading in the Book of Mormon and I've been reading about this verse I, I can't remember I think it's like Alma 27 or something where it talks about not procrastinating the day of your repentance and so we we read those verses and uh, talked about it a bit and all of a sudden Ashley um, I just knew it's like I knew it, it, it's 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 like those verses just they they cut me to the heart and communicated faith to me in exactly the same way that this the words of God in the Bible had done thousands of times over the previous 47 years it's because i knew that the words defined like in what it does is defined in romans uh, 10 17 where it says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of god and and how it does that is described in hebrews 4 where it says that the that the for the word of god is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and able to pierce between the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart that that it, nothing is hidden from the eyes of him with whom we have to do it just lays it just opens you up and shows you and and just goes down deep in your soul and just cuts you and shows you communicates faith that you didn't have and that's exactly what happened and I was like wow this is this is the word of God <laughs> and and uh, I, I just knew because what I had experienced that this was that 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 I'd experienced so many times I experienced in exactly the same way through the Book of Mormon which is very hard to do if you're an evangelical Christian because you're, you're taught, you're t deeply inculcated to not believe that it's the Word of God. And another thing that the Bible, Word of God, says about how this works at the beginning of Hebrews 4, it says that the Word of God preached, the Word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So you actually have to have a measure of faith in it to hear it enough for it to communicate faith to you, if that makes sense. It's a bit of a catch mm -hmm. too, which is yeah. why it's so beautiful what it says in Moroni 10 about, and other places throughout the Book of Mormon about how you have to have uh, real intent. And, and you, you can't, I, I had to get to a place, which I finally got to after a couple of months, where, where you're, you're not hearing it with skepticism and trying to disqualify it but where you really are in a place where, well, Heavenly Father, I don't yet have faith that this is your word, but gosh, I, I hope it is. I, I, I don't yet have faith that this is your word, but if it is, please, do what you do with your word. Cut me. Communicate faith to me. Open my heart. If this is your word, do that. It, you, you have to like be able to pray that kind of a... You have to have that much openness to it in order for it to really speak to you with the power that it's designed to speak to you with so mm -hmm. anyway that's that's how my long journey ended sorry i have to that blow. is oh you're good <laughs> so that's that my is... that's my comeback story Ashley. i love it i love it story. that is so beautiful i 
I'm just, it's so amazing to hear I just so many things you said today that I will never forget. Like this was just such a powerful, powerful time with you. And you're just such a powerful person that has such a special mission. And thank you. Thank you for spending this time with me. And thank you for coming on and allowing me to hear your story and allowing our listeners to hear. And where can, where can people find you online? Well, if they just, uh, the name of my channel on YouTube is David Malvin Alexander. And, um, yeah, if they just do a, a search for David Malvin Alexander. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to send you uh, a link, to the, the channel link. And if you can put yes. that channel link at the top of the description so people can see it right below the mm -hmm. video without having to click on more. Yep. You know, uh, because well, Lauren, if, Lauren's if, our YouTube expert, but I'm sure she knows exactly yeah, what you're talking about. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll email you the channel link. And if she can okay. put the channel link in a place where it can be easily clicked on, because what happens, see, I'm like, I, you know, I, I, I got to tell you, can I give you, can I talk for another five minutes? Is that okay? Yes. Yes. Of course, yes. Uh, what happened? is once I, once I, you know, investigated for two to three weeks and then dug in my heels and left and then came back and humbled myself and glory broke out, I started excitedly telling my, my friends, wow, these Latter-day Saints, they're amazing. I might become a Latter-day Saint. And they're like, what, what, what? And they, they send, start sending me these anti-Mormon YouTube oh, yeah. videos made by the self-styled evangelists to the Mormons trying to save the, the, their own Mormons and, and talk about priestcraft. It's like their, their channels are very thinly disguised businesses, actually. But they've made, they've made quite a, a profitable ministry out of trying to save the Mormons. And they say, one, one married couple I know, just really dear friends, uh, they're just terrified for me. And they send me three of these things. And I'm like, well, I love these people. I admire them. I better listen to these. So I listened to them. I was just like horrified. And so I'm like, this is nuts. And I go on YouTube and there wasn't much stuff effectively answering these characters. And what really made me irate was that they're supposed, they're trashing the most beautiful thing on earth based on what to me was a, a terrible misuse of something I love dearly, which is the Bible. Like, like mm -hmm. they would take, say, the baptism of our te uh, baptism for the dead and our temple work and and our, our certainty that that people can respond, hear the gospel and respond on the other side of the veil. And, you know, the, these these evangelists, the Mormons, they, they they'd take that stuff and they would trash that as unbiblical, demonic lies based on one half of one verse, Hebrews 9.27. It's appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. And I'm listening to this, and that's the only thing that they trash it as demonic garbage with. The most beautiful, you know, just beautiful, beautiful, yeah. true stuff. And I'm sitting there listening to this, and I know off the top of my head, six verses that support Latter-day Saint faith and practice that I had wrestled with and wondered about for almost half a century. And I know these people know those verses, but they pretend they're not there. They cherry pick mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. order in order to demonize and slanderously lie about the most beautiful thing on earth. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I have to do something about this. At that point, I, I didn't even have a laptop. I, I, I went online, I bought a seven-year-old Apple laptop and started I, I just opened it up and I just blah, and I started putting it up. I love it. And I ha and I haven't stopped. I just say all this just to say I probably have three hundred videos up by now. And the, these anti Mormon characters are they're like they, they they've put up all sorts of anti David Alexander videos trashing me because if you can't if you, if you can't uh, if you can't answer what somebody says, the next best thing to do is, is what's called ad hominem attacks. If you can't defeat the argument, you try to trash the person. You know, I, well, I don't even I don't said. even listen to this. I don't even listen to this stuff. But all I'm saying is that uh, 
I've got probably 300 videos up, and it's it's a bit of a confusing mess if people just put in David Melvin Alexander yeah, on YouTube. Totally, it's better if they go to the channel. So got it. In yes. any in any case, these characters they, they started they saying, well, he, he he's just excited. It's in his, the first flush of his you know conversion, and you know he'll taper off. But I, I haven't tapered off, man. I can't. I can't yeah. help myself. I, I, I say yeah. if, if I if I don't make if I don't make four or five videos a week, sometimes two or three in a day, my head would explode. So well, it's just like you said earlier. You were saying you were talking about how you know Jesus says if we're not crucified or those who are crucified for His sake. I mean, you're the biblical scholar here that's gonna, and I'm gonna try and say it and butcher it, but <laughs> that blessed are they that are crucified for my name's sake. Did I say that yeah. right? Yeah, that's that's good enough. <laughs> okay, he said, don't, okay. don't be surprised if the world hates you. They hated me before they hated you. If you were of yes. the world, the, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, therefore the world hates you. And and the reality is, is that, and don't get me wrong, there's, there's hundreds of of millions there's, there's so many lovely people in non-latter-day saint christianity they're absolutely mm -hmm. lovely people but they do not have the fullness of the gospel they do not have the fullness of the holy ghost as their constant companion and their non-latter-day saint christianity does not have the authority of the kingdom so really it's very much under the sway of the god of this world which is satan and mm -hmm. and the proof of this of course is that their churches are filled to overflowing with accusation, with accusatory fog towards the one thing on earth that they should be being drawn to and fall in love with, which is the restored church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, where there's a covenant path where they can put their feet on solid ground on a foundation of living apostles and prophets. You know, this, the city of God, Zion, is the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But... In any case, that's, that's all. That's enough. That's beautiful. Yeah. I just, I, yes, I appreciate I'm sorry you. to dominate the conversation, but I guess no, that's, that's, what, that's what, yeah. yeah, you're good. No, I am just, I am just amazed by you. And I don't know if I've ever met anybody in my life that knows the Bible as well as you do, which is so impressive. Well, you know, don't give me much credit. I smoked way too much pot in my youth. I haven't smoked any in more than 50 years. I'm not, I'm not with the woke program. Like when I was 16, I was actually sent to, I was caught with marijuana and they sentenced me to spend weekends in jail for six months. No joke. I would report. I've been there. I'd I report have... to the county lockup at uh, 3 p.m. on Friday. They'd lock me in a cell by myself in the county jail and release me at 10 a.m. Sunday morning in my parents' custody to take me to Mass. Okay, now you go to Washington State and there's pot stores at every freeway exit with big neon. It's wild, stores. isn't it? State licensed pot stores, okay? <laughs> so I, I'm not with that program, but all I'm saying yeah. is that the only reason why I know the Bible like I do is because it was the only real thing I had. And I'm, the, the the, the forms of Christianity that I search through are what is described in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, where it talks about those who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. From such, turn away. But I didn't have any way to turn, anywhere to turn away to. Okay, so in, in any case, that's, uh, that's the deal. I, I just... Uh, I did the best I could, and, and now I've actually found the true church, and I am so thankful. But the, the only real thing that I had to give myself to was the Word of God. And I, I didn't know how to extract reliably the truth out of there, because without, ap without apostles and prophets, they are the ones that are ordained by God to rightly divide the Word and bring out of the treasure storehouse of Heavenly Father, both old and new, and then the, the, the living revelation that comes forth to them from our Heavenly Father. And, and the, but I knew there was truth there, and I knew that the more I wrestled with that and did my best to just chew on it and hide it in my heart and grope to understand it, that 
that was like the most constructive thing that I could do that had the least chance of hurting me or hurting somebody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you, you know, if, if you do anything, like you could be really, really bad, a really ba defective potential guitar player. But if all you had to do was try to play the guitar for 47 years, you'd probably actually be able to play the guitar pretty well. <laughs> I agree. I agree with that. So I, I'm no, I'm, I'm not like some amazing scriptorian. Uh, I don't know about that. Because of, because of any amazing innate ability or, or because I'm like, I'm utterly untrained, but. Well, you yeah. seem like you, I would call you a scriptorian if I was, if it yeah. was up to me, that's what I would call you. Can we just say a little prayer? Let's do it. Let's do it. Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful for thee and for thy amazing son, Jesus, and for thy Holy Ghost as our constant companion, and especially for Joseph Smith and the incredible restoration and the Book of Mormon and the other standard works and the, the glorious heritage of all those who sustained him and continue to do so. And we just ask that you could help us just to continue to put out wonderful encouraging content that will shine the light of the restoration out into the darkness of this lost and dying world that we could do all that we can possibly do to see the gospel proclaimed in all the world as a witness and see israel gathered and and see a bride prepared for the return of your son and uh, we're just so grateful so grateful for the comeback podcast and i'm so thankful for this this little channel that you've given me and and all the other just countless similar things that are springing up throughout the internet and every other means and and uh, method that's being used to seek and save the lost and to uh, encourage the saints and we just pray that you would help us and protect us and strengthen us to do your will as we move forward together and we just ask this in the name of thy beloved son Jesus amen amen Thank you so much for that. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you. This has been delightful. It has been delightful. I appreciate you coming on. And yes, I, I'm very excited to post this. You're an incredible person. Well, I'm excited to post it too. So if you can, go ahead. We'll send go it ahead, to you. Go ahead and get it to me as quickly as possible. I'd like yep. to put it right I'd like to put it right up today if I can. Yes, perfect. Um right. and if you could send us a a script or a headshot of you do you have a picture sure uh, like a headshot okay you if you can email me that that would be awesome yeah wonderful okay we'll and then i'll it. tell lauren i'll tell lauren that you want the video asap yeah if you could i'd appreciate it because uh i i'm just kind of a throw it up raw kind of person Love you know it. just just let people just let people see the hair the teeth and the eyeballs of the whole thing I love it. Not that I don't edit. I do edit things occasionally. Now that I'm, I'm actually beginning to learn how. <laughs> well, for I don't really months, know how either. For many, months, my editor. for many months, I edited nothing because I had no idea how. <laughs> That's how I am. Lauren is the one that knows how to do all the editing. I just. And, and, and actually, and actually uh, a very significant percentage of the people that watch my channel, they, they, they tell me that's the charm of it, is that it's, it's, it's like the polar opposite of, for example, Pastor Jeff and Hello Saints, you know. <laughs> there, there's, there, there's, there's, no, there's no slick uh, production values whatsoever. I love the, it. The production values are, are, are heart, the production values consist of a heart full of joy, and uh, that's about it. <laughs> I love it. That's so authentic. We we operate the exact same way, so I love Good. it. Well, I, I've watched I've watched some of your stuff, and I absolutely love it. And that's why I was thrilled to come on, and oh, very good. very yeah. thankful that that you uh, somehow wanted to have me on a comeback podcast, even though I'm not someone who left. But hey, since I told story. the story, I had I had a I had a, a leaving and you coming did. back. So absolutely, you did. It turns out you were led by the Holy Ghost to know that I am a qualified comeback guest. Even without that part, you would have still been qualified because okay. you right. your testimony qualifies you. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right, Kay, All right. David. We'll see you. Um, I'll I'll look for your.